picking up where we left off, um, you know, field size was originally, uh, field size limitation collimation was implemented for specifically for patient dose, right? But there were imaging benefits to it as well. With the, the computer algorithms, the way they are, and the main controller of contrast and density and, and all things imaging for the most part, uh, it, it really falls back more to a matter of patient dose. And this is really timely because in the meeting yesterday, uh, two times a year we, we have the advisory committee on campus. The advisory committee is, is made up primarily of clinical instructors and the um, department heads in the hospitals where, where we assign students. But we also have uh, medical staff come over. So we have a, a radiologist that comes and sits in on the meeting too. And we ask for feedback from them what it is that, that they're seeing as being a, a problems with image quality. You know, what are the trends? What do we need to address? And for the last two years, primarily, it's been collimation, life and collimation. People just don't collimate, you know. Um, field size, so it, it's, it, it still has a, an implication in imaging in a lot of different ways, um, some of which we've, uh, I think we've talked about, if not of, of really trying to beat it into the sophomores, is that your field size in part, in large part, affects your display size. And what I mean by that is that the display that you see on your monitor is affected by how much radiation strikes an image receptor and how large that field is. Um, and that information is fed into the computer and it, it creates an image based on the size of that field. So, that doesn't really sound like all that big of a deal, but imagine you shoot a hand and you don't collimate and you put that hand on a field size, the size of the uh, entire image receptor. Well, the, the computer looks at that image and it sees the bones and it adjusts the contrast for the bones and it gives you an S number that, or the, an index number that indicates that you're way overexposed because it's got all this dark area out, out, you know, around the periphery. Even if it's not overexposed, it thinks it is. You could have used the perfect technique, but your, your index number is off. Okay, so that's issue number one, your index number is off. Issue number two is that it sees this hand on this image receptor size that's that big and it tries to display the hand based on that size of image receptor. So it takes that hand and it says, okay, so here's the hand, but it's on this field size that's that big. So it tries to fit this entire field size on the screen. And what that results in is a hand, instead of being displayed, even the size of the normal hand, the hand shrinks down. The hand is, is very small. And if you apply that to a finger, a finger um, then becomes so small that you can't make a diagnosis of it. So uh, you've got two different things going on. You've still got imaging implications in ways that, that we never had to deal with in, in screens and films. You know, in screens and films, it was all about contrast, grayscale, density, visibility, or recorded detail, right? Uh, because the more tissue you irradiate, the more scatter radiation you create, the more scatter radiation you create, the more hits the image receptor and you lose visibility, right? So that was in screens and films. It still has imaging uh, implications in uh, CR and DR. They're just totally different. Field size results in image size changes that are just unacceptable. But the real issue truly is the patient dose now. You know, um, unless the image size gets so small for the anatomy that you have to, to magnify it up, then you still have a good image. But if you have to magnify it up, you know, you, you take an image on your TV or on your computer and you magnify it up enough, and what, it, what happens to that image? Is it still clear whenever you magnify it up? No, it gets pixely, right? Well, so same thing happens to your image whenever you magnify it up off of the screen if, it, if it's too small. It gets pixelated. You lose sharpness, right? Um, <clears throat> so there's that. But the, the real thing is, you know, like uh, the example that the doc used yesterday was lateral C-spine, including the entire skull and half of the thorax. That's an ethical issue. That's a moral issue. 
because the, the techs who, who don't collimate and they blast away at people without any kind of collimation, that's just overdosing the patient. That's as if, you know, you were a floor nurse and you were supposed to give a patient, you know, a milligram of morphine and you gave them 10. You know, the, you, you kind of see the, the ethical issue there. And that's, that's uh, just complete laziness and uh, it's immoral. It really is, you're overdosing the patient. So the, the patient dose, again, becomes more important than what it uh, was in screens and films. It's still important in screens and films, but it also had the imaging uh, implications that are uh, a bit different than what they are now. All right, so um, increasing field size, what does that mean? As far as collimation, what's correlation collimation? If you increase field size, what do you do? Decrease collimation. Decrease collimation. Increased collimation means a smaller field size, right? So it increases the number of photons in the primary beam. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't affect what's emitted from the housing, but it does affect what's emitted, emitted from the collimator housing. So the, the tube housing, the intensity uh, in creation remains exactly the same <laughs> the two techniques with and without collimation, right? But what comes through the housing um, and then comes through the collimator housing is less with increased collimation. So field size decreases what strikes the patient. It, uh, uh, if we increase field size, decrease collimation, then we expose more tissue to x-rays. So, and we kind of drew that out on the, on the board uh, sometime, you know, in the last couple of weeks. So, uh, with the increased field size, we increase the number of photons in the primary beam, which increases the amount of tissue being irradiated, which increases the number of possible interactions. Keeping in mind that the photoelectrics stop inside of the patient, they don't penetrate through. Those won't reach the, uh, the image receptor, um, so they don't really affect anything, but the scatter still does, or the scatter that's emitted from the patient still does. So that spreads a, a layer of fog across the image, and it uh, theoretically reduces contrast, uh, you know, because we still say that we have visibility issues with uh, um, increased or decreased collimation, increased field size. I even lost it up here. Yeah, I didn't even bring my textbook this morning. Yeah, we'll probably wing it. Uh, let's get these out of the way. Turn those off because it'll take a minute to come back up. All right, so we're talking about field size. We've got collimator housing. We've got tube housing. Let's say we've got two different tech. Te well, we've got the same technique on two different exposures. All right. So on one, what we've got is uh, collimated to the anatomy, and we're going to say in this case this is a huge L spine. Okay, so if we collimate just to the anatomy, and vertebrae, I guess we're shooting superior inferior L spine here, right? You're only going to see one layer of vertebrae. All right, so we collimate down to just the spine itself. Okay. How much ra uh, scatter radiation are we going to create? Well, not as much as if we open the collimators and expose the entire abdomen. Okay. So now we're going to create scatter radiation in the periphery that's going to go into, not all of it, but, you know, because Compton can go in any direction, but some of it is going to overlap the anatomy on the image, right? So what is scatter? It's noise, right? And it decreases visibility or reported detail. So between those two exposures, this is going to give you less scatter radiation, you remove some of the scatter, you prevent it from being created, and you prevent all these photons that are created out here from hitting the image receptor. Now, let's reverse this. We're going to flip this around and imagine that you're doing a fluoroscopy. So you're standing right here. All right, so if we collimated down to just the area of interest, would these photons out here be created and scattered towards you? No, right? So with an open field, 
with a decrease in collimation of a wide open field, where is your dose coming from? Yeah, from the patient, for, from Compton. So are there uh, professional dose implications of collimation? The answer is yes, absolutely. The more you collimate, the smaller the field size, the less dose you're going to get because less scatter comes out of the patient. Okay? Now, you know, there are um, formulas in physics and, and uh, calculations that you can make in different types of tissue, how much scatter you're going to create at different KVP levels. And I mean, it gets as complicated as you could possibly want it to get. We're not going to get to all that complicated, um, but what you may have to calculate, so you're not going to have to calculate tissue doses with different KVP and different levels of collimation and all that kind of stuff, but what you might have to calculate is projected field size according to opening size, okay? So what that means is this. Let's say you've got a collimator housing opening, and keep in mind that, that, again, your collimators are set up, you've got two sets of collimators in every housing, right? One set are those multi-leaf things on top that open and close, and there's a diagram in the textbook that shows that on page, uh, well, on page 192, you see that, that thing that looks like a cone on top of the collimator housing. That's a multi-leaf collimator. That's not what controls the field size that you see if you look up into your collimator housing. That's the thing that removes the off-focus radiation that we talked about in the last section, okay? So the collimators you're familiar with are at the bottom of that box, and it's two sets of shutters, okay? That, that is your collimator, and it is two sets of shutters. It's four individual uh, shutters, okay? So when we're talking about field size, uh, in calculation of field size, what we look at is four different things. We'll set up a ratio type problem. All right, so your opening is here, okay? Um, well, your focus, let's say, is here. And then you've got your collimator opening here, and you've got a distance from the uh, focus to the opening. You've got a distance from the focus to the uh, image receptor. And then you've got the opening size here, and then you've got the projected field size here. Okay. Now, if you look in the textbook, it's got a, a you know, it's got each one of those things defined, and it, um, you know, it's a little bit of a cumbersome uh, formula to memorize, and it's kind of like the inverse square law in that you've got, you know, each one of these things: the the source to opening, the source to the image receptor. The, uh, the opening size and field size. So what's easier to remember for you know, most people is that you've got two large measurements and two small measurements, okay? And how you can set this up is by comparing, you know, formula uh, or a uh, ratio type formula and problem equation is kind of like you're comparing one thing to another, okay? And as long as you get the two set up properly across from each other, uh, it doesn't really matter which way you set it up. Um, you can invert the entire thing and, and things are gonna be fine, okay? So what are your two large measurements? SID and field size, right? So that means so what we're left with are two small measurements, which are source to opening distance. That's not SOD, source to object distance. I just didn't have room to, to write opening. Source to object distance and the opening size, right? So you have a big, a big, a little, and a little, okay? Now, when we're setting the things up, what we want to do is we want to set up the things, uh, the, the measurements across from each other that are most related, okay? What I mean by that is you don't want to put your field size, which is your, this measure of big, um, with your, uh, 
let's say you're um, across from your uh, your source to, to opening distance. Okay, does that make sense? What is this most related to? Right, the opening size, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna select whichever big we wanna put on top. So uh, you tell me which one you wanna go with. SID. SID, okay, so SID. So what we're gonna say is we've got an SID of 40 inches, okay? So we're gonna say 40 inches over, so what's the other one? Field size. Let's say our field size, we're going to keep it simple for this, and we've got a, a, a in the PowerPoints, if this thing ever comes back up, I've got a uh, one already worked out, so this is just kind of on the fly. Um, we'll say our field size, oh, there it is. I don't know that's going to come up up there. So Can't that's picture me. Okay, so what's that? That's in the collimator, like that's the collimator and the first set of leaves. This is the, uh, um, the, the 40 is the SID. And okay. what she's talking about as a whole. As a whole, yeah, you, okay, okay. So you're, you're talking about this opening yes. being the combination of the two? No, not really. Um, you don't ever see the, the multi-leaf. Uh, collimation. If, if you could see that, it would actually be a round, really more like an octo octagonal, mm -hmm. you know, because those, those things just create a, a round projected um, field, okay? So what you're actually visualizing is not so much that first set of collimators, but the second set of collimators. So that bottom one right yeah, there? The bottom, yeah, the bottom, yeah. So your, your housing, your tube housing is here, your collimator housing, oops, yeah, the collimator housing is right there. So we're, we're measuring your shutters that you use whenever you open and close your collimators. Okay. Okay, so if you were to flip the, the tube up and look inside, you know, and you're not looking inside the tube, you're really looking inside the collimator housing. Those are the things right at the bottom that you can see. Okay. Okay. Because you can't even see this one <coughs> because of the mirror, right? All right, so 40 inch SID, and then we've got the other big, and we're going to say our field size. We can plug in any number. We got a 12 inch field size. Okay. So maybe the question says that at 40 inch SID, uh, you project a 12 inch field size, and you've got, uh, um, let's say, uh, an SOD or source to, to opening size of 10 inches. And so what is your opening size? What is your opening size? All right, so we've got SID. We're gonna put across from SID, the source to opening size, and we said that that was 10 inches. And we don't know what our uh, collimators, you know, what, what it measures. So how do we solve that? Cross multiply, right? So we got 40 X is equal to 120. So X would be equal to 40 divided by, or 120 divided by 40 would be three. So we've got a three square inch opening, okay? So uh, again, your, um, your uh, formula in the textbook is a little harder for me to remember than what this is. Now, what if you flip this whole thing around? What if you said, okay, you got to the test and you said, okay, I don't remember which one to put on top and you invert one. Well, as long as you keep the right things across from each other, then everything's gonna turn out okay. You know, your field size should be across from your opening size. You're comparing those two things, right? Those are the most similar. This is the opening that's gonna project that field. So they're gonna be across from each other. These two are the most similar. They need to be across from each other. So if we inverted this whole thing and said 12 over 40 is equal to x over 10, well, we'll cross multiply and still have 120 is equal to 40x. So as long as you keep those things across from each other, the, the comparable things across from each other, you're not going to mess this up. 
you know, you can flip the whole thing and it's, it's still going to come out exactly the same. Yeah. So for the first uh, problem that we did, X is sawed? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. X was, okay, let me, let me go with this. This was 40. This was 12. Um, this was X and this was 10. So what we didn't know was the opening size. Okay. What is this formula called? Again? Field size. Field size? Yeah. Okay. Field size calculation. Let's see if this will settle through. There's uh, two things. There are, you know, problems and questions and answers for um, uh, the um, collimation, field size calculation, and all that in your DeAngelis. And I'll be taking some questions out of DeAngelis and, and put them on the test as well for this this coming test too. What chapters? You know. Uh, I, I think it may be the same chapters. Um, I don't have it on me. Um, I'll look it up and, and put it in Canvas, but it, it may be the same chapters. So remember, whenever you're working those those problems in DeAngelis, you know, uh, consider what it is that we've talked about, and consider what it is that Bouchon, you know, teaches, and if there's something in there that just doesn't make sense, or if the answer. Uh, <laughs> You know the explanation of the answer doesn't match the the letter answer. Uh, keep that in mind. You know the mistakes get made in, in the books and and uh, use a you know a little bit of critical thinking with it and, and try to apply what it is we talked about to those. So uh, looking at it from a different perspective, now we've got a, a situation where we've got um, the the opening size. We don't know what the projected field size is going to be, and that's what we're looking at here. So you set it up the same way. You got a, a 40 inch, ah, 40 inch SID. Um, the uh, 10 by four diaphragm is five inches below the target. Um, what's field size? Well, you got your 40 inch SID. Uh, that would be one of your bigs. And what you would put across from that is you don't know what field size it size is. So it'd be 40 over X uh, is equal to five over 10, right? So. In a case like this, what you would have to do is you'd have to calculate this out twice. So, um, you know, because it's rectangular, before we, we talked about a uh, field size of a square, right? So this is a rectangular field size. So you'd have to calculate in, in both dimensions. Realistically, um, in a lot of cases, if you had a problem like that on a test, uh, you could probably eliminate a couple of them uh, right off the bat, because if you calculate one of, of the the rectangular shapes or sizes you've got one measurement and there's probably going to be a couple on a test that just don't fit that measurement so you can probably eliminate two of them just by uh, you know working half of the problem all right okay so just summary of the the uh, the things that affect the amount of scatter created inside of the patient we had the kvp with increase in KVP, we get an increase in penetration. We certainly get an increase in penetration of those photons that would scatter. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the the total interactions, um, you know, you, you get a, an increase in uh, photoelectrics. You get, a, get an increase, a proportionally greater uh, increase in the um, the amount of scatter radiation that we create. So um, in that way, we say that scatter increases, uh, and it's really according to the, um, the proportion of photoelectrics that, that we have, all right? So that gives us an increase in the remnant beam, specifically a scatter and penetration, 
and what that does is that it decreases the uh, the contrast, so to speak. Really, just increases the fog. Um, the contrast is is really pretty unaffected because of the computer algorithm, right? So the amount of tissue irradiated, that is your collimation, um, depending on, on which way we're looking at it, uh, it could be the thickness or the volume. Um, the, uh, the larger the field size, the more scatter radiation we're going to create. But also the, the tissue type as well. What type of tissue creates more scatter radiation? Fat or soft tissue, right? So generally, whenever we're looking at field size, or not field size, but uh, patient size differences, what are we looking at? Generally. Soft tissue. soft tissue, right. So we're gonna create more scatter radiation with larger patients, so volume thickness um, is, is going to increase scatter radiation. But remember that uh, as the thickness goes up, a lot of that scatter is gonna be absorbed inside of the patient, so we're gonna lose a lot of uh, photons before they strike the image receptor. But what comes through the patient, again, is more likely to be scattered. So tissue composition really depends on what type of tissue. Again, the soft tissue is, is what's going to create more scatter radiation. <clears throat> All right, so how does scatter add to the image? What does it do to contrast? Decreases contrast. What does it do to density? Uh, you know, it depends on the context. Uh, again, whenever you uh, change from a, a asthenic patient to a hypersthenic patient, you create more scatter, yes. But does it necessarily increase density? No, because that scatter is going to be absorbed inside the patient. Sharpness for reported detail does nothing. It's all about visibility of reported detail. All right, so um, technical compensation. Anytime that we have a, um, we add a factor or, or change something that reduces photons, be they scatter radiation or not scatter radiation, then we have to do something to compensate for that. So we shoot the perfect technique, right? We, we've got absolutely the perfect technique, and we didn't collimate. It's perfect technique for a KUB, all right? So those photons that scatter, are they going to put density on the image? Absolutely will. So if we remove those photons, we had the perfect technique before, we remove those photons because we increase collimation, then what, what's going to happen to our exposure to the image? It's not going to be enough, right? So we need to reintroduce those. All right, so what was the purpose for collimation from an imaging standpoint? Reduce scatter. scatter, right? So between our technical factors, which one increases the likelihood of scatter? KVP. KVP. So what technical factor would we want to use if if we remove the scatter by collimation? Would we want to increase KVP and reintroduce that scatter? Mm -hmm. No. So our technical compensation is going to be yeah. max, right? Very good. All right. So. <clears throat> Um, we want to increase mass because uh, beam limitation limits scatter radiation, but KVP increases scatter. Uh, so KV increasing KVP would be counterproductive, um, so we're going to increase mass. Now, how do you compensate when you're using AECs? How do you compensate? What do you specifically do if, if you shoot a, a KUB on a patient? And for whatever reason, the, the patient's having a KUB and an APL spine. What are you going to do when you collimate down for the APL spine? Select your cell. Okay, you select your cell. Okay, um, so on your KUB, you may, may use the outer two, you may use all three. Very good. You're going to select the cell, probably just your inner cell for the, for the L spine. As far as the technique goes, What's going to happen with the technique? Huh? Drop. I, I'm not hearing. Drop it. When you when you collimate in, you're going to reduce your your technique, or the the photo timer is going to reduce the technique. Who says reduce? Who says increase? 
and everybody else says, I don't know. <laughs> it's going to uh, automatically increase. Again, you can play with your, your machines and, and uh, you know, kind of prove this stuff out. And it's going to be subtle. You know, it's, it's not going to be a, a massive increase, but uh, who's at ETM? Ah, UT Main. Okay, good, good. You've got that torso fan, right? So, you know, you've got multiple quarter million dollar pieces of machinery that, that you can use to learn. And that's what it's there for is to take care of the patients. But secondarily, it's there for you, you guys to learn off of. So use it, you know, don't let it just sit there. Uh, you know, in down times, you, you, you really have a choice to, to walk into a room and truly try to understand this stuff or sit out in the light room and listen to the gossip. Which one's better for your education? Right? So uh, take that torso phantom and you know raise the tube up as high as it can go so that you can have a field size as large as you could possibly get and photo time one image. Uh, that, you know, that'd be an exaggerated KUB, but photo time one image and then collimate in as tightly as you can for the L spine and shoot it again. And then look <coughs> at your, uh, what your S number did, right? Look at what your S number did. Look at what your, whenever you make your exposure, look at what your mass readout says, okay? And, you know, hopefully it'll help to solidify some of this stuff. So if you increase collimation, you need to increase technique. If you photo time and you specifically don't do anything except for possibly select cells, um, the, the photo cell is gonna take care of it. And it should, if everything's working right, you make that second exposure on collimated L spine, it should give you a higher mass value. Your, uh, your index number, your S number, should be relatively similar between those two exposures. Okay? It won't be identical, but uh, they may be close enough. You know. All right, so that's everything that we do to limit uh, scatter radiation creation. Now it's created, we have gotta do something with it. Before it strikes the image receptor, we have to do something with it. So, um, most commonly what we're going to use is a grid. And this is an exaggerated representation of a grid. You can think of grids as being uh, just these almost like boat stalls or, or slips where uh, radiation can come through. Or you can think of it kind of like mini blinds, right? How do mini blinds work? Uh, sort of filter, yeah, they filter or block light, right? So if you're going to sleep in on Saturday morning, do you want your mini blinds to be open to where the light comes through? Mm -hmm. No, you close them, right? So if your blinds are open, then they are relatively parallel to the light, right? You can adjust them to where they're more parallel or less parallel to let more or less light through. So what we want are grids that are constructed in a way to allow the, the um, penetrated photons through, but if we've got wide angle scatter radiation, it's not getting through there, okay? So what we have are areas where x-rays go through. What's the word we use for things that x-rays go through easily? Radiolucent. And then we've got radiopaque material in between them. Construction of grids can be with a lot of different things. And when we say radiolucent, it's radiolucent, radiolucency compared to the radiopaqueness of the lead. Okay, so, you know, some of the grid construction, the inner space material, what you've got is you've got the grid strips, which are lead, and you've got the inner space material, and some of the, the uh, grids, the inner space material, is going to be made of something that's relatively radiopaque. Aluminum is sometimes used as inner space material, okay, for reasons we'll talk about here in a minute. But uh, com when you're comparing the two, radio, the uh, aluminum is much more radiolucent than what lead is. That, you're just not going to get through it, whereas the aluminum you can still penetrate through it, okay? So, the purpose for a grid is to absorb scatter radiation that's scattered within the patient and emitted from the patient, and it cleanses the remnant beam of some of that scatter radiation, um, mainly confidence. Remember that your classical scattering 
is very narrow angle, and if it gets through the patient, then it's probably going to be paralleling your penetration. So it's, you know, it very well may get through. But your scatter radiation, your steep angle scatter radiation uh, Comptons, it's going to absorb most of those up. So it cleans those out of the remnant beam, and they're made by alternating strips of radiolucent, radiopaque material. They're developed by Gustav Bucky. You remember last semester we talked about Gustav Bucky and the Bucky assembly in your uh, wall bucky or in your uh, table bucky or just named after him. So really the bucky itself is not the grid. It incorporates the grid, but it's not the grid all by itself. The bucky is the tray where you put the, the, uh, the grid, all the electronics that goes into that, um, and the grid itself. So all of your wall buckies and all your table buckies should have a grid inside. So again, they're designed to transmit only the x-rays traveling in a straight path from the tube to the image receptor and uh, through those radiolucent hallways, so to speak. So scatter is absorbed in the radiopaque grid strips. Those are the lead things. So the inner space material is, rel is radiolucent relative to, again, those lead uh, grid strips. So we have two different measures of grid effectiveness. <clears throat> one is grid frequency, and it's the easiest one, and it's just a measure of how many grid strips we're gonna have in a given uh, distance. Uh, maybe per millimeter, or not millimeter, but uh, maybe per centimeter, maybe per inch, but it's just a measure of how many grid strips we're gonna have, all right? so. Uh, standard for a lot of years was like 178 lines per inch. So that's a lot of lines, right? So they're, the lead strips are, are little bitty thin, tiny strips of lead. Um, and what we found is that uh, when we started using uh, CR especially, but to a lesser degree DR, uh, we wound up with a, an artifact that we hadn't really counted on. All right. Have you ever taken a picture off of your TV or off your computer screen? You got these weird little squiggly lines that weren't on the original image. Okay, so if you if you take two electronic things and you try to line them up, and the the um, the grid pattern for the image display on those two electronic devices are too similar, you know, if if the pixels are about the same size and the the array of those pixels are too similar. And what you get are those squiggly lines. And that's what you call an alacing artifact. A-L-A-I-S-I-N-G. Alacing artifact, also known as a moray artifact. M-O-I-R-E, moray artifact. All right? So whenever we um, first went to, to CR, we started seeing these squiggly lines on all of the, the images. And that's what the problem was, was that the display and the, the detectors were too similar to our um, grid frequency. So what they had to do was they had to increase the grid frequency so that there was enough of a dissimilarity there that we wouldn't see that artifact anymore. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a bit. But um, the more important measure of grid effectiveness is what we call grid ratio. In grid ratio, you're going to struggle a little bit with. You know, I'll explain grid frequency first because it's pretty easy. It's just grid frequency. How frequent are the grid strips? Grid ratio is a little bit more complicated, and you're going to have a tendency to uh, confuse a couple of things. Okay? The uh, grid ratio is the comparison of the height or the thickness of the grid strip here here to the distance in between them, okay? What you're gonna have a tendency to, to kind of conflate is the height of the grid strip and the thickness of the grid strip. It's not the thickness of the grid strip that we're interested in, it's the thickness of the inner space material. The height of the grid strip, how thick it is, how tall it is, and how much room there is in between, okay? We'll take a look at that here in a minute too, or probably on Wednesday. 
realistically. Okay, so I use this analogy, uh, this story. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't really, you know, tell y'all stories just because I want you to know about my childhood or the stupid things I've done in my life. It's to try to help you to understand these concepts, right? So when I was a kid, uh, I had an older brother. Uh, he was about seven years older than I was. And uh, you know what Nerf guns are, right? I mean, everybody's had a Nerf gun or been shot by a Nerf gun. They didn't have Nerf guns when I was a kid. They had these uh, guns that were pre-Nerf gun. They didn't have the sponge dart with a suction cup on the end. We had a hard plastic dart with a suction cup on the end. And it was a big suction cup. All right, so we get these things for Christmas, and you know, I grew up in a house that was built in the in the 50s. And back then, they didn't have open floor plans. You've probably been in some of these houses where you got a long hallway. So we had a hallway, and one end of the hallway was the master bedroom, and the other end of the hallway was mine and my brother's bedroom. And there was uh, there were hallways up and down, bookshelves, and another room in between. But the hallway itself was easily as long as, as this room, okay? So it's a good long hallway. So we'd start out with however many darts we had and one gun each at opposite ends of the hallway. And the object was to, you know, to shoot the other person. So we were having a battle in the, um, you know, in the hallway. So the hallway was very narrow. It, it was only about three feet wide and all the way, you know, the, the, uh, the distance from one end to the other was probably 50 feet or better, right? So he'd start at one end, I'd start at the other end, and at that distance, you know, if the, the hallway was only about this wide, how straight did you have to shoot to get from one end of the hallway to the other? You had to shoot parallel to the hallway, right? If you were just off by just a little bit, it'd be bouncing around and, and you wouldn't be able to hit each other, right? So, that's one thing. Um, the closer, though, that you get, you know, if, if he advanced on me and he got to the, the bedroom door that was right dead square in the middle, then I could be a little bit more inaccurate, right? So the shorter the hallway, the easier it is to get the darts down the hallway. Okay? You follow me? If I had a bigger hallway, a wider hallway, then I might not be able to hit him, but I could get the dart from one end to the other, okay? So, applying that, what we've got in grid effectiveness and grid ratio is we've got those hallways, right? These hallways. So if I took these hallways and I made them more narrow, scrunched them in, how much more difficult would it be for these photons to get through, even if they weren't scattered? It'd be a whole lot harder. Now, is that gonna clean up more scatter radiation? Yeah, it probably is. All right, so if I took these hallways and I made them much longer, is that gonna make it harder for them to get through? Absolutely. Is that gonna absorb more scattered radiation? Yes. All right, so the, the true measure of grid effectiveness is how much scattered radiation is it gonna block? How much is it gonna absorb before it gets to the image receptor? So there's two ways that we can really increase the effectiveness of the grid. Both involve more lead, right? The lead is what's going to absorb the, uh, the, the scatter radiation. And we can do that either by adding lead strips or increasing how tall they are. Okay, so back to our more artifact, and we'll close with this. Back to our lacing artifact. What, what was it that caused that lacing artifact? Too similar, right? So the number of lead strips that we had was too similar to the display and the image receptor. So we had to make them more dissimilar. We didn't want to lose any kind of effectiveness. So what we did, what we needed was a different grid frequency, right? Grid frequency was a problem, grid ratio was not a problem. Grid ratio was good. So what we had to do was take our grids and basically cut them in half, right? Cut them right in half and take those and put them side by side. Mash them together so that our grid height, our grid height remained the same. Or I'm sorry, our grid height was cut in half. Our uh, number of grid strips doubled 
but it, our grid ratio remains the same. Now we're going to work through some math problems on grid ratio um, on Friday, or Wednesday rather, this is Friday. We'll work through some grid ratio problems and we'll, we'll talk about how uh, different grid ratios give us different dose to the patient and um, how we got to compensate and because of that compensation gives us a different dose to the patient. Okay? So be thinking between now and then about your grid ratio and grid ratio being the height of the strip and the, the distance in between and the comparison between those two. Okay? Any questions?